Happy to have you all back for what happens to be our 212th episode of Think Pickle-Wise Human Humane Architecture. We're broadcasting live still in the midst of unprecedented intertwined crises of coronavirus, COVID, climate, and out of control capitalism. And we all have to reconsider the things we do, or at least we should. And what you do here on the island is primarily inviting people over to then ripping them up. So uh, anyways, we have uh, the utmost uh, specialist panel for that matter here with one of the finest hospitality designers, uh, Ron Lidgren, uh, being with us from his Long Beach, California. Hi, Ron. Hello. And we have you, DeSoto Brown, Bishop Museum historian, who just told me and someone else that from early childhood you were interested in preserving things. And you grew up in the heydays of way more innocent hospitality on the island. But so, rapidly growing into a major industry, too, I might add. Exactly. And don't, don't get us wrong, you know, as far as I understand DeSoto and you, you know, live that on a daily basis and your ancestors did too, you were very open to welcoming people. There's nothing wrong about that. It's actually really great. But then America came or the Western civilization and basically commodified that and, and cashed it in. And that's where it becomes a problem. There's dependency, there's greediness, and then there are all these things that are potentially problematic. So we have at least spiritually with us someone who's even more qualified because she has a master's degree in these things in um, business and tourism. And it's our exotic escapism expert, Susanne, how she is pronounced in Germany and Suzanne here. And let's get us next to the next slide. And uh, you guys share how she was with us. Well, uh... She is now Mrs. Despang as of this year, and she was lucky enough to come out here for a continuation of her honeymoon. But unfortunately, she was confined with her new husband through quarantine to their not particularly lavish uh, hotel room, not hotel room, but apartment. And I wanted to be able to get together with her, and we fortunately were able to do that on her last day. And we had a brunch at the nearby Denny's restaurant. Now, I chose this because uh, Martin and I watched this Denny's being built near our homes, respectively. And as a non-engineer uh, and non-architect, I marveled at how so much of this is artifice because the finished product looks as though it's made of stone and looks as though it's made of concrete and it looks as though it's made of all these different materials, when in fact, a lot of it underneath is just a steel skeleton with plywood over it and then veneers over that. Nonetheless, we did have an enjoyable time there. We were conscious, however, that this is still the time of COVID. And while we were waiting, because the restaurant is only op operating at half capacity and half of it has to remain empty, we had to wait outdoors to be able to get in. We wanted to sit in their outdoor seating area, which is nice that they have it along Cujillo Avenue, but we were told we're not allowed to do that. That's closed. So we had to sit in the front. And ironically, when you're outdoors where you've got a lot of air circulation, you still have to wear your mask. When you come indoors, when you're in an air conditioned environment, you take your mask off so you can eat. So it's actually the opposite of what would be the respectable or the, or the reasonable thing to do. However, that is the reality of the upside down world in which we live today. And I was really grateful that I was able to spend time with Suzanne. Um, we had a really fun talk. We had a really enjoyable meal. So that was nice. But of course, we couldn't help but think about all of these other things that we're concerned with, even as our enjoyable brunch was going on. As we all are, yeah. And a little bit of rehabilitation. But I have to say, the older you know you grow, speaking about myself, the more maybe in peace you are with certain things. So revisiting the show that we did about it that you referred to at the top right and looking at these pictures, I have to say, you know, it is a sort of a weird kind of species of like a skeletal stereotopics because the main pilasters are actually out of CMU. So maybe not. And what I, you know, after having seen so much sort of Hawaiianized 
in the term of cashing in stuff, this at least doesn't even try. It just, you know, is American. The American diner, it says, and the client is a former a Bank of Hawaii CEO. So given all that, but again, as you pointed out, the total, it's all American, it's all air conditioned, although it doesn't really have to. It's location. The, the still what remains the, the worst lost opportunity is typologically. You should have built, and we're obviously biased, like a primitiva on there on that side, really max it out. Making you know a one-story building is really a waste of land. But but other than that, maybe not quite as bad as we started out with, but still, as you said, absurd, sort of upside down or inside out, the whole you know, COVID uh, um, prevention uh, compliance kind of thing. Different than uh, a place we're going to go next, at least virtually on the, on, this, on the next slide. And that's your turn, Ron. And this is a, on a very bittersweet note. Yes, uh, the day after uh, uh, Suzanne and, and Martin met uh, DeSoto for a meal at Denny's, I was going to have the pleasure of meeting her for the very first time. and. I thought uh, with the hours that we'd spend before she got on the plane and headed off for uh, Munich, Germany, that I'd take her to downtown Los Angeles. Uh, up until, uh, well, 10 years ago, downtown Los Angeles closed at five o'clock. It was just a dead city. But in the, in the last 10 years, all the old banks and office buildings that historically uh, used to be the, the West Coast's financial center, and then it all went to San Francisco. All of those buildings uh, have all been turned into lofts, and all of a sudden there are 50, 50 to 60,000 new residents in downtown LA. So I was going to take her to the Grand Central Market, which has been there for well over 100 years, an emporium for food and also restaurants, and also some rather interesting uh, gourmet restaurants. I wanted her to go to, not Denny's, but Egg Slut. You can believe that's the name of the restaurant. They were famous for egg sandwiches and their breakfasts. And I've stood in line trying to be hip there in the past of 100 people waiting to get my, my egg sandwich. Uh, and you'll notice on the picture on the left that the entire front of the street of the Grand Central Market, which is right downtown in the heart of L.A., is all given over to outdoor seating and it's it's used and it's very busy and cars are just banished to wherever they need to be. Uh, and up to the right, you can also see inside the, the market uh, because most of the space is in an old building, uh, some guests sitting beneath a wonderful neon art installation. And several of those happen to be located on the walls of this wonderful place. The Grand Central Market is sort of the, the heartbeat in the center of this new area of downtown where these new 60,000 people have come and enlivened the city for the first time. Uh, unfortunately, Suzanne did not get to see, see all of that. And Martin will be explaining what happened. Well, and there would have been other goodies to add to the to the bitterness of it, that would have been um, Bunker Hill, Lawrence Halprin. That would have been your container community center where you would have had, uh, you know, lunch. And yeah, let's not even go any further. Uh, and by the way, to the left again is like comparing locations. You got pretty nice weather too. But we got the nicer ones. So again, we hermeticize ourselves as in the Denny's. And, and as you know, I don't know if we were clear enough to Soto, but they, although there was a, a pure capitalist is the client, the Bank of Hawaii, former CEO, but he didn't do uh, zero lot line uh, construction. He left, uh, you know, space, interstitial space between the sidewalk and the building for outdoor seating, but it's not allowed to use. And here they do it, right? They even steal, you know, the parking from the street and dedicate it to the people. That's what we want to see anyways uh, in tempered and in, in, in moderate climates and temperate climates in the summer. This is feeding both basically uh, climate change and, and COVID. So that's the way to go. Yeah, next slide. Um, also, um, when she was still here, uh, she was looking online for the best spots to eat. And one is called Heavenly, and it's in uh, Killingsworth, which was formerly the 
uh, Seaside Hotel, now rebranded as the Shoreline. You see this easy breezy gentleman in the PI mobile in front of it uh, when you were here, Ron. Uh, we didn't get a chance to go to that one. And that building was basically the one and only, as you told us in that respective show that at Killingsworth and Alfred Yee did as a spec project, uh, as an investment, uh, very cultivated capitalism, by the way. You know, usually when you do something for monetary reasons, you do it the fast and the cheapest way. Not in that case, not in these days, not for these gentlemen. And they basically sold it to United Airlines. United Airlines is our trusted um, uh, air carrier for all these years. And unfortunately, in, in this case, and that's the reason why you couldn't meet up and you had her met her, you know her well, but just remotely, but you wanted to see her meet her the first time uh, in real. And that didn't happen because the plane that goes forth and back from, L from LAX and, and Honolulu broke down. And obviously, we're lucky they found this out early enough. Uh, so she was safe, but unfortunately, uh, you know, she missed out on uh, the best to, to meet you, Ron. Uh, we throw in Jay's and my hat there from this respective show when we were, as we thought, for no good reason, not enough good reason in quarantine. And now uh, that little stamp there, which is upside down, which says if you turn your head around, says OK, is the recognition of the United Airlines personnel, ground person personnel around checking in recognizing her fully vaccination proof of evidence that gets her all the way through to where she got that vaccination from, which is Germany. And she has safely arrived just a few hours ago. Uh, but uh, going to the next slide, uh, this is trying to make up uh, to for, um, you know, that she wasn't able to be with you, Ron. Uh, and these are the things we desperately tried to do to make up for that because we went to your hotel, the Lay Low, which is where we as the Komomos put you up when you were here visiting us for the National Symposium. And you guys were both keynote speakers there. Uh, the Lay Low is on Kohio, and by the way, is an autograph collection hotel. And what that means we do later down when we get back to the Mauna Kea. And she also took the picture at the very bottom right, especially if you, for you, Ron, because she's a big fan of the Holly Kalani. In fact, introduced me to the Holly Kalani before we even got to know each other. So on our morning walks, she was doing the uh, supervision, um, uh, uh, the auditing of the construction work. And we were worried because they were working on the edge of the pool and they had been uh, re-basically uh, doing it and, and uh, re uh, casting it and painting it and we were worried that's going to stay that way but then they luckily basically um re uh, tiled it with this beautiful tile that you were telling us about in in your respective holly kalani shows and now we're now a third through the september and if they hold true to their announced reopening on october 1st i think the good news is what you can see from outside there isn't enough time le left to screw, screw it up if they would ever do that. And we certainly count on that they're not doing that. So this is all, again, us desperately trying to, you know, have, you know, time with Ron, have her time with Ron and around Ron's places and creations. And she's standing there posing for you in front of the Halekoa and the very jungly uh, 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 landscape around it that makes up for the very jungly landscape at the top right and explain a little bit where that would have been and what you had as a task for her. Oh, uh, I'm a, a little bit lost because that's your quite... that's your front yard. Oh, that's your jungle <laughs> front yard. Yeah, I, I really, uh, as of today, in fact, I finally renovated my jungly front yard after it's been trampled, trampled a bit by some of the construction people working on my renovated house. And I was going to introduce Suzanne to uh, a bamboo grove and roses and clivia and ground ivy and you name it. Uh, and she has a strong urge to get back to gardening again. Unfortunately, I didn't get to tell her, get to show her my attempts at being a green thumb. Yeah. 
and talking green thumb and blue tiles. Uh, the, that very beautiful uh, tiled pool that they kept gets us finally back to the Mauna Kea Beach Hotel that we're on. So next slide, please. And we see a similar pool. And that, this, that picture is from you, DeSoto. You please tell us what's behind what we see. Well, as you said, we're back at the Mauna Kea Beach Hotel. And this is a photograph taken right pretty soon after the hotel opened. And this was the pool that was constructed at the time that the hotel was open, 1965. Now today, as we were talking about beforehand, a hotel of the caliber of Mauna Kea would probably have a huge pool with a lot of fountains, water features, lounging areas, et cetera. But at the time, that wasn't considered necessary, particularly because in this particular setting, there's a huge beach to swim at as well. So this pool is just sort of an adjunct to the swimming that you could have in the ocean. Nonetheless, it does have a blue tile pattern on the bottom of the pool. Now, I don't know, none of us know if this pool is in fact still there today and if, what, what it looks like because the hotel has been through some really major renovations after the earthquake of uh, 2013, I believe, caused some damage to it. So. But there is a connection in the, uh, between what we just saw at the Holly Pulani and its famous orchid mosaic at the bottom of the pool, along with this one at the Mauna Kea Beach Hotel, of a similar pattern at the bottom of the pool. Yeah, and it just, as we said before, it speaks that, um, you know, in, back in the 60s, and we're sort of on a break of our automobile architecture, uh, many more shows to come. And while you know, the Straßenkreuz are the big street cruiser boats that I associate so much with, with America were big. But uh, today's SUVs, some of them are even bigger. And that's certainly true in architecture and everything, you know, bigger, bigger, bigger. Uh, Michael Green's movie, like uh, Super Size or whatever it's called. You know, houses were like 1,200 square foot to begin with or even less. And then they were like 1,800 and now they're like 23 or even 3,000. So things are bigger, bigger. So even though this is, and you, you guys will talk about that even the guest rooms in this hotel were rather, you know, decently sized originally. And this, uh, you know, ended up being the most expensive hotel in the world ever built at that time. But regardless, things that were still relatively modest and not grown out of scale, right? That's sort of our point. And again, since it's, it's doubtly if this is still existing, uh, the hotel has been lucky to stay pretty original, but the landscaping and the, the outdoor areas, probably not. So again, kudos to Halekolani that they kept you know, the, the signature pool with the uh with the with the tiles that was so important and sort of smuggled into the project and if you want to you know we make you curious about revisiting obviously ron's four shows about his project so please go back and rewatch them go back to the architecture go to the next slide uh this is an exterior perspective uh, donated by som and uh, there's a brochure. And who's the master collector of brochures? I am the master collector. I'm the master collector of brochures and other tourist-related ephemera related to Hawaii. And this is a uh, brochure from right when the hotel opened. And you can tell if you look at the picture behind the couple that's on the beach, you can see that the palm trees are all newly planted. They haven't even been growing there for very long. Now, the thing that I find interesting with the photograph on the left is from the side view, you can see that the hotel, while it appears to be a long, low rectangle when you look at it from the front, actually has a stepped design that you can clearly see on the side. And what that does is gives you not only a view when you're looking towards in that direction, but it also protects the lanais below from the view from the people on the floor above. And that's because there's a lattice work or um, a set of louvers, if you will, made out of wood when this was originally built that prevented you from being able to look down on the people literally on the floor below you. But it wasn't also just a big rectangular block. Now, as Martin just pointed out, however, this is not a totally unique structure because we see it in the housing that was constructed for the Munich uh, 1972 Olympics in Germany. And that's the picture that was just added in the upper left. So 
there's a similarity between those two structures, the Mauna Kea obviously being earlier from the 60s. Yeah, so we call this Terrassenhaus, which means Paris house. Doesn't take much of a weekly German lesson, but that's a lame one. <laughs> Uh, and so that was a very popular feature as Ron, you as the, uh, as the Zeitzeuge, the, 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 the time witness can, can recall, it was a very sort of fashionable thing back then, but it got very beautifully adapted to both locations, you know, in uh, the one in, in Hawaii, in a tropical condition where it's always hot. It's very much, it doesn't look like a plant, which these days there's biomimicry and people make, the architects make things look like plants. This looks truly man-made, but it basically performs a, a lot like nature because it's, you know, it's staying cool. And there, while in Munich, you have the temperate condition of basically the sun being your friend uh, in the winter time. And so you can, you can, you know, heat up your space in the wintertime. So both are conditions that are very in the best sense of true modernism being very performative, basically worked, uh, worked fairly well. And you could, if you're like in a postmodern mood, which none of us ever is, but we know people still are, you can even say the Mauna Kea looks like a volcano, right? It was erupting out of the earth and was basically in this section taking this sort of pyramid shape and volcanoes are bigger at the base and smaller at the top. So there's all these different ways to basically look at it, which, which just makes it even better. So a very sort of multi-readable uh, architecture that, um, that for its time was, uh, was, was pretty, was pretty uh, you know, not unique as we say, uh, was sort of you know, in the air. Uh, amongst architects, but was was really customized that sort of international style kind of you know typology of terrace house uh, was pretty uh, you know uniquely customized to the very specific conditions of um, of uh, the the Big Island in Hawaii by architect Bassett. Uh, let's go to the next slide and go back to the other project around it which is the golf course. And here's uh, another brochure by your DeSoto. Yeah, right. And this brings up the point which we've already brought up, but again, worth mentioning, which was that the hotel was contingent, the development of the hotel was entirely contingent upon the ability to build a golf course at the site. And if it hadn't been possible to construct a golf course, the hotel would have been a no-go. They wouldn't have built it at all. Now, this is something which is a fairly recent development in certainly the history of hotels. When the Royal Hawaiian Hotel opened in Waikiki in 1927 as an ultra luxury hotel, there was no golf course. It wasn't possible to build a golf course in Waikiki even then. They did construct the Wailai Golf Course some distance away, but it wasn't considered absolutely required. By the 60s, for a freestanding resort hotel, it was considered a requirement. And that's why we see pictures, uh, these two pictures, showing, showing off the fact that there is a golf course there and a very famous golf course, too, built on this really rugged coastline with one uh, hole where you've got to tee off and get your ball all the way across an ocean inlet to where the green is. And a lot of people never bet the ball all the way over there. And how important the golf course uh, was and still is, we see on the next slide, which is a right. historic picture here, where we see it had been completed even before the hotel was completed because there are still the cranes. I mean, the hotel is pretty much in a final stage of construction, but still not completed. And the last, uh, the two show quotes at the top right allude to two other architects who have been involved, and one of them, uh, who is a fellow of yours, Ron, the other. Uh, architect who has shaped hospitality design all over the world, also having started out in Hawaii, that is Pete Wimberly, your great colleague. And Pete basically had, um, very soon after the hotel was completed, um, it was given to him to add on to the hotel. And then it was John Hara, who we see, and his beautiful 1965 Mercedes SL 
Pagodi, and when uh, Larry had fixed us up with our PMIing, PIing mobile and a leaking a gas line, uh, basically um, uh, uh, John Hara was in scheduled for the next morning. And so John basically did the necessary remodeling uh, after the earthquake, which was in which year again, DeSoto? I believe it was 2013. And there was, the hotel mostly came through that pretty well, but there was some significant damage to at least one wing of it. So they took that opportunity to, when they fixed up the earthquake damage, to close the hotel and do a really major renovation, which we will talk about more in the future. But I also want to mention, too, the black and white photograph that shows the golf course in use. This was a golf tournament that was staged even before the hotel opened, which was publicized or it was uh, broadcast nationally on television in the USA. So that was a way of promoting the hotel via the golf course before it had even opened to the public. Yeah, and talking, promoting and needing to close, we're at the end of the show, but we want before you, Ron, please share with us as a, um, as a AIA fellow, uh, what, how the hotel was perceived amongst its architectural community. And we make some reference to that at the very top left, but you have something to add above and beyond that. Yes, the, the AIA honored the Mauna Kea for its longevity. Uh, 25, they gave it the 25 year award. And every year they, they select a building that has survived, has been successful, and they consider it to be a worthy addition to the canon of fine architecture. And the Mauna Kea received that award and rightly so. Yeah, and in addition, as you can read here, it was awarded already an honor award by the AIA right after it was completed in 67. And then uh, in 2007, it, may, it had a top 150 of America's favorite architecture list and it made it on that one. So it got, and if you go on their website, you know, they list many more also from the hospitality realm. So it's a highly, you know, honored veteran, we can say. And with that, uh, we leave it for now and return one more time, wrapping this up and reflecting a little bit more above and beyond and for its future uh, next week. And until then, please, you guys stay all brutalistically tropical exotic. Bye-bye.